It's so good to see you all here this morning. We are finishing up our series, The, the Words of Christmas. And if you remember, in week one, we, we talked about the things that we want, right? We all have a Christmas list, things that we want. And I asked you to think about not in terms of PS5s or switches or a new car, but what you want the Lord to do for you. To not be afraid of, of asking for that which you desire. That means you're going to get it. But don't be afraid to ask. And then last week, we talked about getting things we don't expect, right? Surprise, right? We, we sometimes like surprises. Other times we don't. But God sometimes loves to surprise us. We think we know where our life is headed. And then God shows up and goes, actually, I want you to do this. Surprise, right? So if you missed any of those messages, you can find them on our website, gatheringatl.com. Today, though, I want to talk about preparations, Something we have probably all been doing a lot of this past month, if not longer, right? We're all getting ready for Christmas, right? The stores began preparing for Christmas before Halloween. Some of you are those weird folks who start decorating for Christmas before Halloween. I'm sorry to call you weird, but you are, okay? It is odd if you start that early. But 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 now you are alone because we've all joined in with you. We're we're decorating now, right? Like normal people. But we you know we put our deck our Christmas tree up. Uh, right after Thanksgiving. That's how it's supposed to be done, FYI, right? The stockings the stockings are hung with care, right? We now have a poinsettia in our house, right? The gifts have been, been bought. And, and this past week, we surprised our kids with a trip to see Santa, right? The real Santa. And I know he was the real Santa because he was at Cabela's on 92, right? So that has to be the real Santa. And surprisingly, he sounded like he was from the South Pole. Um <laughs> See, my kids didn't like that joke. I think it's funny. They don't have a sense of humor. Um, but we're all in preparation uh, for, for Christmas right now. No matter what your plans are, you are preparing. Now, our plan is to have all of our family over this weekend. So we've told the kids that part of their Christmas gift is they get to clean the house. Right? They didn't appreciate that gift. But that is part of their Christmas gift to the family is cleaning the house. Like I said last week, sometimes we get things we didn't ask for. So surprise, y'all are cleaning the house. Uh, but preparing for Christmas is a big deal. We know what is about to happen, right? Santa Claus is coming to town. And so we have to get ready. Right? That whole song, Santa Claus is coming to town, is about preparation, right? You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. That is a creepy song, right? That is a very creepy song. But it's all about preparing for the big man to come down the chimney with our gifts. And so we teach our, ch our children for that for 364 days of the year, they need to make sure they do everything they can to make sure they're on the nice list, right? They better not even cry because a single tear represents one less gift under the tree, right? Okay, maybe you're not that strict, but... But we understand what preparing for Santa Claus means, right? Now, hopefully, we're also sharing with our children that Christmas isn't really about Santa, but it's actually about the birth of our Savior, right? That's actually what Christmas is about. Hopefully, you know that. It's about the birth of Jesus Christ. In less than a week, we get to celebrate the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, God with us. And every year, I think about Mary and I think about Joseph and all they had to do to prepare for the birth of their child. One, they had to get past the whole virgin birth thing. I'm sure that took them a good minute. And then they weren't even married. And now Mary was pregnant, right? And she could only hide her pregnancy for so long. And so think of the ridicule they must have faced, right? The sideway glances, the, the rumors, the, the accusations, the loss of friendships, people avoiding them. Right For nine months, nine months full of joy that you're pregnant with your first child. Nine months full of joy that he is the son of God. But also nine months of whispers and rumors. And then they had to travel to Bethlehem for the census. Right at the point that Mary is about to pop. And so ladies, you're nine months pregnant and your husband tells you to hop on a donkey and ride it for four to five days. That's probably not going to go over well. I asked my wife to give me a cup of water when she was nine months pregnant one time. I learned a very important lesson that day, right? And then Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem, and they, they need a, to find a place to sleep, but there's no room in the inn. And so they ended up in a cave surrounded by some 
animals. I know your nativity scene at home is nice and pretty, but most likely it was a dirty cave full of smelly animals. And this is where Joseph took Mary, right? Mary must have really loved Joseph. Then Mary realizes the baby's coming, so they had to prepare that dirty cave to receive the Christ child. Parents, you know the preparation that goes into having a baby. They had a lot to do to prepare for the birth of their child. And we're all preparing for the birth of the Savior. And we can't wait to celebrate that on Saturday. But there is another coming that many of us never prepare for, let alone think about. And that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. So I want you to hear me today, church. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is returning one day. And as his followers, we are called to get ready. We are called to prepare. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Not that Santa is coming to town, but that Jesus is coming to town. So let's look in 2 Peter chapter 3. And I'll just let you know right now, we're going to read all of chapter 3. It's not that long, but it's more than I typically read. So Peter chapter 3, it's vital for us to hear all of this chapter. Look at it with me. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, this is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through, our, through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as, as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. Speaking of these things in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand. And those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of Scripture. And this will result in their destruction. You already know these things, dear friends. So be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. All right, I know that's a lot. We're just, let's walk through it. So if you have your Bible open or you have an app on your phone, I want you to just uh, leave it open. I want you to circle, underline the first part of verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come. I want you to underline that circle, and then I want you to underline and circle and highlight whatever you want. The word will. The day of the Lord will come. No one can stop it from happening. No force known to man can stop it. No force unknown to man can stop it. The day of the Lord will come. So just to make sure I don't leave any of you behind, I want to back up for a second so you understand where we're coming from, right? On that first Christmas of 2,000 years ago, we know Jesus was born, right? And then at the age of 30, he began his ministry. For three years, he traveled around preaching and, and healing, and none of that made the religious rulers happy, and so they conspired to have him arrested and killed, which they did. 
And so at the age of 33, Jesus was killed, right? He went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. The debt of sin had to be paid, but you and I, we don't have what it takes to pay it. Therefore, uh, we were destined to the, for punishment for the punishment of sin, which is eternal separation from God after we die. But because Jesus took our sins upon himself and paid the price for our sins, the debt of our sins has been forgiven, and we can regain uh, right standing with God. But we, we also know that's not the end of the story, because three days after he was killed, Jesus rose from the dead, right? Jesus conquered death. He then spent 40 days on earth appearing to his followers, right? And then he ascended into heaven. Now, before he was arrested, he said something very interesting to his disciples, one of which was Peter. It's found in John chapter 14. Peter, uh, uh, Jesus said, My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to, pre to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, now hear this, I will come back and take you with me that you may also be where I am. Jesus was saying, yeah, I'm going, but I'm coming back for you. Again, if, you, if you're looking at John 14, uh, 2 and 3, you can go ahead and, and circle the word will. I will come back and take you to be with me. See, Jesus Christ is coming to town. Are you ready? I know you're ready for Santa, but are you ready for Jesus? See, that's the question that Peter's dealing with. Are you ready for Jesus? Because he is coming. Are you ready? Now this morning, I'm not going to spend our time talking about exactly what it's going to look like when Jesus comes. This is not a sermon on the concept of the rapture. I'm sorry to disappoint some of you. But here's the thing. I don't know exactly what the second coming of Jesus is going to be like. The Bible gives us some ideas, but frankly, I, I think that the detail that really matters is that he's coming back. Right, whether he's coming around the mountain riding six white horses or he'll be traveling country roads, I don't think it's that important. The thing that matters is that Jesus is coming to town. So that's what I want to focus on today. What do we do to prepare? How are we to prepare? Because church, we are, to, we are supposed to prepare. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? That's what Peter's dealing with. And if you want the simple takeaway from today, it's found in verse 14. When Peter said, and so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. See, the preparation for the second coming of Jesus is how we live our lives until then. See, too many people have bought into this lousy theology that, that, that you ask Jesus to save you, and then you just go back and ride, your, ride out your life. Right? They see salvation as nothing more than their get-out-of-hell-free card. Right? It's their fire insurance. The moment of salvation is all that matters. Their salvation is nothing more to them than a blank check, right? This has been called cheap grace. It's this idea that we can have Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord. Hear me, church. Salvation is not the end. Salvation is the beginning. Salvation is the beginning of your new life. When you are saved, you become a new creation. Too often, people announce they are saved, and then they go right back living the way they did before they got saved. Now, hear me. I'm not about to stand here and question someone's salvation. However, I will all day long call out the bad theology that says there is no, there is no call to holiness in our lives. Peter said, until Jesus returns, make every, someone say every, every. make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are what? Pure and blameless in his sight. This is a call to holiness. Now pay attention here. Pure and blameless in whose sight? In Jesus' sight. So what does that mean? It means he's judging our holiness against his holiness. Do you see that? See, I, I can walk into an art gallery with an up-and-coming artist to judge her work, but what I think about her work means next to nothing because I'm not an artist, right? I can't paint a red ball. But if an artist of the, of the level of like a Picasso or Monet said the painting was good, that would probably carry a lot more weight than anything I said. Why? Because they understand what makes good art. We are called to be pure and blameless in his sight. In the Old Testament, God said, give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. In fact, in his first letter, Peter quoted that passage from Leviticus in 1 Peter 1.16. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. 
This wasn't just a call on the lives of the Jewish people, church. It's a call on our lives, every man, woman, and child who surrenders their life to Jesus. This is how we are to prepare by how we live our lives right now. But unlike Santa, we do not know when Jesus is going to return. And anyone who tells you otherwise is absolutely nuts. We don't know. We do, hear me, we don't know. But the question of when Jesus will return has a lot of people to stop preparing. And I get it, right? right if, I, if I told you for 364 days that Santa was, was coming, and then on that 365th day he didn't show up, you'd probably be a little bummed out. But you might be willing to give it another go, right? And so you wait another 364 days because I told you Santa Claus is coming. And on that 365th day, he doesn't show up. You would begin to write him off, right? You would begin to believe that he's never going to show up. Now imagine waiting for over 2,000 years. Why hasn't Jesus come back? I mean, let's be honest. What is he waiting for? The world seems to be falling apart all around us. Where is he? Now would be a great time for him to show up. Like, I don't know everything that's going on in Europe right now, but just looking around the U.S., I mean, come on, Jesus. What more do you need to see? Let's be honest. We don't like to wait. And the longer we wait, the grumpier we get. And if we have to wait too long, we just give up and walk away. I've actually walked out of businesses that, when I felt I had waited too long and not been taken care of by the staff. Right? That's what we do. If we have to wait too long, we just give up. We write it off. Walk away. The early church was no different than us. And so Peter addresses in verse 4, they will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? But then look at what he wrote in verse 8. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. See, God is not beholden to our time. We are beholden to his. But hear me. He doesn't keep us waiting just to make us wait. See, the Bible tells us that God is love. And so his waiting is an act of love. Hear that. His waiting is an act of love. In verse 9, Peter wrote, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Underline the word your in that second sentence. He's, be, he's being patient for your sake. That your is referencing that whole whosoever clause we talked about when we talked about John 3.16. Whosoever believes in Jesus will receive eternal life. Jesus is being patient so that everyone has the chance to repent and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And our, our preparing for the return of Jesus, our living a holy lives, helps to make that possible. It is our holy lives that are a witness to the lost and hurting world of the holy love of God. But hear the warning from Peter in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. You see, church, Jesus' return will not be advertised. There will be no advent calendar to count down to the day Jesus returns. Your favorite TV channel will not have one of those annoying pop-up ads at the bottom right corner every five seconds letting you know that Jesus is returning uh, on such and such date at 8 and 9 central, right? He will return when he wants to. But he's not here right now for one reason. Because it's not time. It's not time. There are people who do not know him as their Lord and Savior. There are people who have never heard his name. Even, yes, in East Cobb, there are people who have never heard the name of Jesus. There are people in Rochester, New York, who have never heard the name of Jesus. There are people in South Florida who have never heard the name of Jesus. There are people who have never heard the gospel in a way that would compel them to surrender their lives. He is desperate, church, for every person to be saved. That is why we prepare. We prepare by living holy lives. We live holy lives to reach and bless the lost. And so, church, 
are you preparing because Jesus Christ is coming to town? Hear me. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake and for the sake of others. Our whole world is full of lost people. Our world is hurting. They need the followers of Jesus Christ to prepare for his return by how we live our lives today. Are you preparing today? Are you preparing? Again, I know you're getting ready for Christmas, but what about Jesus? It's not a rhetorical question, church. It's a question we all must answer to ourselves. Are we preparing for the second coming of Jesus by living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight? Are we? And again, we believe in authenticity here at the Gathering Church, so I'm not going to lie. i got room to grow. Right? I have more holiness that I need to pursue. And I will pursue holiness until the day I die. But I'm pursuing it. Are you? Is there something in your life today you know is not the will of God for you? Maybe it's a relationship you're in. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a way of thinking. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's a behavior. But something you know is not the will of God for your life. Maybe no one else knows about it, but you do. So what is it? I've got my own issues. And I'm willing today to name them before Jesus. Are you? See, I'm inviting you to prepare for Jesus with me by living a life of peace. And one that is pure and blameless in the eyes of the Lord. If we will do that, there is no telling the impact our church and our lives can have on this community and on our families. So what is it for you? In a moment, we're going to share in communion. 